I'm going to begin this evening with some words from Jesus, words that perhaps would shock a lot of people. Luke 14, verses 25 to 28. Jesus says this, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, his mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? That is what Jesus demands. That's what he asks of those who follow him. That's what he calls the Christian to. In other words, undivided loyalty, complete commitment. They sound in some ways, don't they, like the words of an extremist. But they're not. They're the words of God in the flesh of Jesus Christ to everyone who calls themselves a Christian. And what he's saying to us is, well, following me, following Christ, is not a light thing. He demands that we make him king of every part of our lives, in all things. And effectively, that's what the Israelites here. They have the same message at the end of the book of Joshua. Now, they lived before the coming of Jesus, but they hear the same call. Worship the Lord serve the Lord, make him king in everything that you do. So Joshua ends with this very radical call to be committed to Yahweh. Joshua gathers all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. That's the place where they are. His time is almost up. He's an old man and he's soon to die, as we, we read at the end of, right at the end of Joshua. Last Sunday, we heard him gathering, I think, just the leaders of the tribes, speaking to them, those entrusted with authority to teach and lead, calling them to be faithful. Now it's everyone. It's the whole nation. This is quite a gathering. And they come not just to hear from Joshua. What does verse 1 say? They presented themselves before God. Verse 2 says they hear from God. So Joshua here is just the messenger. This is a, a solemn assembly. It's a, a sacred moment. Yahweh is addressing them. Now we're doing something similar this evening. We might be much smaller in number, but we are presenting ourselves to the Lord. That's what we do when we come to an act of worship, to hear from the Lord. And he has a message for us, as he did for the Israelites. Two big things happen as they gather Firstly, they are reminded of their redemption. Verses 2 to 13, God tells them why they should be committed to him. Secondly, there's a call to respond. Verses 14 through to 24, God tells them what true commitment looks like. So why they should be committed to him and what that commitment looks like. And then the chapter ends with a sort of a ratification ceremony or, or, or covenant of the covenant and then the death of Joshua. Let's hear what God has to say to his people. Before God calls the Israelites to do anything, he reminds them what he's done for them. Verses 2 to 13. These verses really are the story of their redemption. They're a, a potted history of God's grace in four parts, an account of God's utter commitment towards them. The focus here is completely on what God has done. Notice the number of times as we look through this that it's, I did this, I've done that, I've done the following. It's very God-centered. Listen and be reminded of what I've done for you. And it starts with God's call of Abraham, an ordinary man, and we're told a pagan man. Verse 2 tells us that Abraham served other gods. So, Abraham did not find God. God found him. I took your father, Abraham. So there was nothing super special about this man. He is the product of God's grace. It's amazing. 
that God singled out this man to be the father of this mighty nation. But it was all of God's grace, called by the grace of God, and he was given a son by God. I gave him Isaac. I mean, that takes us back to this morning, doesn't it? In Psalm 127, a reminder, the Lord is the one who gives life. And indeed, he was a miracle child. We're not given all the details here. This is a sweeping account of, uh, of many years of history and the first five books of the Bible in just a few paragraphs. But Isaac indeed was a miracle child. He was born when, when Abraham was around 100 years old, Sarah in her 90s. God had promised them a son. They had to wait, but God kept his word. That's the theme of this book, isn't it? That God keeps his word. He promises at times we have to wait, but he will fulfill every detail of his promises. And he gave Isaac, Esau, and Jacob. These are the patriarchs, the original ancestors. The Israelites are named after Jacob because God changed his name to Israel. And so he's reminding them, look, look, you are a chosen people. It began with Abraham. I chose you. You are chosen by my grace. I found you. I made you by my power, by my grace. So that's the first part of the story. They're a chosen people. And they're redeemed. That's the second part of this potted history, verses 5 to 7. Jacob goes to Egypt. They're enslaved in Egypt. But God sends a rescuer. Again, the emphasis is all on what God does. I sent Moses and Aaron. He brought judgment on their oppressors. I plagued Egypt. He freed them from slavery. I brought you out. In other words, none of this was possible without me. Only by my power were you saved and set free. Reference is made to them getting stuck at the Red Sea when they, they reach the water's edge and the, the Egyptians are chasing them and it looks like a dead end and it looks like everything's going to end badly. Abraham was a miracle child. The Red Sea escape was a miraculous one again. Another manifestation of God's faithfulness, of his power, of his grace, of his faithfulness. The Israelites were saved. The Egyptians were destroyed. It's a work of God. It's a demonstration of his grace. So here God says to his people that you are a chosen people. You are a redeemed people. Thirdly, he says you've been a protected people. Next, he comes to the wilderness years, verses 8 to 10. A time when they rebelled. They doubted. They were faithless in many ways. And yet God was faithful to them. They were made to wander for 40 years in the desert. And yet God was gracious to them. He didn't abandon them. What happened when they came across opposition, when they were attacked? Well, God says, I protected you. I looked after you. I kept you. Two events are singled out. Verse 8 reminds the Israelites of how God fought for them against the Ammonites. Now, this is an event that's described back in the book of Numbers, chapters 21 to 24. What does God say? I gave them into your hand. I destroyed them before you. That's the first event he, he singles out. The second, in verses 9 and 10, is the story of uh, Balaam, again in the book of Numbers. Now, Balaam was a pagan prophet. And the king of Moab, uh, to sort of sum up the story that's being recalled here, the king of Moab tried to hire this man to curse Israel. He could see that this mighty nation were coming and he, he wanted this prophet to curse them, to stop them in their tracks, to cause them problems. But God says, well, I turned that curse into a blessing. I overcame the power of that prophet because he wasn't really a prophet of mine. I would not listen to Balaam. I delivered you out of his hand. Are we getting the message? The story of the Israelites is the story of the calling, the saving, the protecting of his people. It's God saying, I am the one who gave you victory. And the final part of the story is the one that they've witnessed, this generation have witnessed. It's the conquering of the promised land. The story in four parts, it ends with the conquering of the promised land. Everything that we've read about in the book of Joshua. 
verses 11 to 13. God lists the opposition that they faced. God lists how he gave them the victory. And he takes the credit. I gave them into your hand. It was not by your sword or by your bow. So everything that you have, the place you're standing on now, the land that's been given to you is from my hand. Without me, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't exist. You wouldn't be this mighty nation. You wouldn't be in this land. You are a product of my grace. The land you possess is a gift. That's how the story ends in verse 13. Everything you have is by my hand. The fruit you eat. You didn't plant. The houses you live in, well, you didn't make them. I, I've given all this to you. You can't take the credit. Now, the Israelites have this glorious history. And it's the story of God's greatness. It's the story of God's grace. They're created by God's grace. They're redeemed by his power. They're protected by God's faithfulness. They're provided for by God's goodness. This is God saying to them, look how committed I am to you. Remember everything that I've done, all the blessings you have received, your, your forefathers, but you also, this generation. Now their story is our story. In fact, ours is a longer story. God's goodness to his people doesn't end in Joshua. This is only the sixth book of the Bible. There are another 60 books to come at this point in the history of God's people that testify to God's faithfulness, his goodness, his greatness, his grace, that he keeps his promises. God promised Abraham not only a people, he promised to bless the nations through this man. And we've witnessed that blessing through Jesus Christ. He is the descendant that was promised. Born in the line of Abraham, but much more than Abraham, God himself in the flesh. And what has Jesus done for us? Well, he's in him. We are chosen. We are redeemed. We are protected. And we are provided for. All of the things that the Israelites are reminded of. Jesus finds and he calls the people just like Abraham. What has God done with us? Well, he took the initiative. The Bible always says, well, it's God who saves. We don't find him. He finds us. We were lost without him. We were rebels without him. Godless until he called us by his grace. And so the church is of his making in a worldwide sense. Each Christian is of his making. We did not find God. He found us. And we are redeemed. In Jesus, we are saved. We have our own redemption story. Not of slavery out of Egypt, but slavery to sin. We are miraculously delivered from the power of Satan. He's given us new life. He's given us freedom. How? By the laying down of his life at the cross. Now, what we're not told here is how the Israelites were saved themselves from the judgment of God in Egypt. But we know, don't we, many of us, having read that part of Scripture and knowing it well, that, they were, that the Lord's judgment passed over them because there was a, a substitute, a sacrificial lamb that was shed. The blood was posted on the, 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 the lintel of the door that, that the judgment would pass over. We have that better sacrificial lamb. We have Jesus Christ. That's where our redemption is found, our forgiveness of sins. That's how we are children of God. So we are chosen in Jesus. We are redeemed in Jesus. We are protected and provided for. Everything that we have is of his hands. Our health, our food. He protects us from the evil one. He promises to bring us into our own promised land. Not Canaan, but heaven. Everything is magnified and greater. The story that we have to be reminded of. And so God says to the Israelites, look what I have done for you. See my abundant, my consistent grace towards you. And in the same way, God says to each of us tonight, well, look what I've done for you, Christian. How I've chosen you saved you, provided for you, protected you. Look back 
on your past life. Look how I've provided for you. Look how I've provided for my church. Look around you. See what I'm doing now. See my unfailing power to provide. The depth of my grace to save you. Again, like Abraham, not because we are worthy in any way. We are chosen by the grace of God. Salvation is by his hand. It's all of his grace. That's the starting point of this gathering in Shechem. And that should always be the starting point of any gathering that we have. Seeing what the Lord has done for us. The Lord is at the center of this gathering, isn't it? Again, once again, we see that worship, true worship of God's people, is centered on seeing the Lord Jesus. Seeing God. That's what makes this meeting different from anything else that we might do. Because we seek to have God at the center, his word, to see him more clearly. And so we gather this evening to remember his works towards us. The greater works we witness in Jesus Christ. Before God asks anything of us, he says, look what I have done for you. And it's a long list. We gather by the grace of God this evening. We stand or we sit here this evening simply because God has been merciful towards us. And so each of us who are believers this evening are a marvelous product of his grace. And we are being reminded of our own story, which indeed is much longer than the Israelites. God reminds the Israelites of his commitment to them. But secondly, he calls them to be committed to him. That's the second part of the chapter, verses 14 through to 24. Because the story of redemption demands a response. Verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. That's the call. Worship me alone. There is no room for any other rivals. It's a call to complete, undivided devotion. That's really the the call at the heart of this final chapter. And they do have a choice, verse 15. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Notice here the choice is not between believing and not believing. It's a choice about worship. The Bible doesn't believe in atheists. It doesn't believe that any of us are non-worshippers because we have been made to worship. And so if we do not worship the God who made us, we will worship a substitute. That's always the message of the Bible. There will be some fake imitation that we will serve, that we will bow down to. We might not describe it that way, but that's the reality because we've been made to worship. Something or someone will become the focus of our devotion, the thing that we follow, the thing that drives us, that we crave, that we cry out for if it's absent. And so the question here is not whether we will serve, it's whom we will serve. Whom will you serve, Israelites? Will it be Yahweh or will you choose the the fake gods around you? We no longer hear of the gods of the Amorites, do we? But there are other things that have replaced them, as has been the case in every age. We all bow the knee to something or someone because we're born worshippers. Notice as well that it's not enough to simply know about God. A response is required to his revelation. Jesus called people to follow him, to repent, to become disciples, to serve him. It was interesting a couple of weeks ago in our prayer meeting, someone prayed that they wouldn't be a fan of Jesus but a follower. I thought, well, that's such a good expression because... There are plenty of people who admire Jesus, who are interested in Jesus, who know lots about him, but there's a big difference between being a fan of Jesus and following Jesus. And that's really what's being called for here, that they would follow the Lord. 
The word serve here is also a word for work. And so this is God saying to them, I don't just want you to hear me or even remember all of this. I want you to do something in response. I want it to transform the way you live. It's calling for a decision, for action. The Lord calls us to worship him and work for him. Joshua has clearly already made his choice. He leads the way. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the decision I've made. And so he's the example to his people. Yahweh will be his king. That's who he serves. And, and, and this very speech is evidence that he follows the Lord, isn't it? He faithfully wants to point his people to their God. He's a faithful messenger of God's word. He gives God the glory for all that's been accomplished in his life. This book doesn't end with how wonderful Joshua is. And look how wonderful his leadership's been. And look at everything he's achieved. Well, it's all about God, isn't it? He's the one getting the glory here. Joshua is the instrument, the messenger. What's the response of the people? Well, they agree. It seems they have been listening. They, they see what God has done. And they promise to serve the Lord. There's no arguing. There's no grumbling. There's no dissension. Yes, Joshua, we completely agree we will follow. We sign up to this. They express their devotion to the Lord. But that isn't the end of the meeting. Joshua has more to say. And perhaps what he says next surprises us. Now, isn't this what God wanted? In a sense, they've ticked the box. They've said yes. They've raised their hands. They want to follow. Surely this would be a good time to wrap up the meeting. The commitment's been made. Or has he? Verse 19. But Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. Now what's Joshua doing here? Why is, this seems pretty negative, doesn't it? <laughs> Hang on, they're all in agreement. So, you know, why the negativity now, Joshua? Well, he's doing this. He's saying, I want you to count the cost. This is not a light decision you are making. God wants more than your words. He wants more than the raising of your hands in a meeting. He says, don't take this casually. Don't take this lightly. You need to think this through. God doesn't want your words. He wants your heart. He's doing something similar to Jesus. It's all or nothing. God will not be shared with another. That's what is meant when he says, well, God is a jealous God. Perhaps that confuses you. You think, well, hang on. Jealousy is something negative. How can a perfect holy God be jealous? Well, he's jealous for his glory. He won't tolerate rivals. He says to them, have you thought this through? That's Joshua's message. You will be judged if your actions don't match your words. Don't make this commitment lightly. What's the response second time? Well, again, they say, we will serve the Lord. They are adamant. Joshua says, prove it. Verse 23, put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. He gives them something practical to do. He says, don't just talk the talk. Walk the walk. Go and take those gods, some of whom perhaps you've picked up or been influenced by some of these nations that we've been fighting. Get rid of them. Don't think you can combine your worship of one thing with another it's it's god wants your undivided attention your complete commitment now for a third time they cry out we will serve the lord but notice something the third time they cry out they don't mention putting away the foreign gods i don't know if we read too much into that but it's interesting that they don't say yes we'll do that they cry out and say yes we will follow now that's something following generations failed to do they would forsake the Lord. They did forget God's goodness towards them, his grace to them. Many said they would serve the Lord, but not all of them did. 
again, what's the message for us? Well, Jesus likewise calls us to count the cost. That's what that opening reading was all about. Jesus sort of shocking people and saying to them, have you thought about this? Because following me is not a light thing. It's a radical commitment. There is no such thing as easy believism in the Bible. In fact, as you read through the gospel, sometimes it's surprising because it it seems like Jesus is trying to put people off following. Particularly those times when he's popular and there's large crowds wherever he goes. After the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6, he questions the crowd. He says, why are you here? Are you following me or do you just want your bellies filled? You just like the food, don't you? And that drives quite a lot of them away. And I think probably his disciples are like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> you've got a great following here. Why are, you, why, are you, why are you driving these people away? Likewise, the rich young ruler, he leaves disappointed when Jesus calls him to sell everything he has and follow. And this is a man who's very religious in lots of ways, who seems very moral and uh, charitable in many ways. And, then, and Jesus picks out the one idol of his life and says, you Deep down, you worship your money, don't you? You've got a choice here. Will you follow me, or are you going to choose the money? And he wouldn't give up that idol. He goes away disappointed and sad. What do you love more, me or money? What do you really worship? Put away that idol you serve is the message. And so Jesus, likewise, demands exclusive loyalty. You cannot serve me and money. He is the king who calls for a complete allegiance. There are some in our church, aren't there, who will have dual nationality because they've been raised in one country, they've moved here, they've got passports for two nations, that's a a great thing. Citizens of more than one country, that isn't possible with God. You can't have your foot in one kingdom and one foot in the other. You either belong to his kingdom or the world. And that's why Jesus says you must count the cost. Don't make this commitment lightly to follow me. Understand what it entails. I'm not merely interested in an emotional response, an instant response. I'm interested in your heart. I want you to follow not just this day, but in days to come. And that's going to cost you something. Are you prepared for that? Do you know what kind of commitment you're making? That is a helpful word for us, I think, in the evangelical church generally because perhaps we have been guilty at times of promoting an easy kind of response to the gospel. In one sense, it is easy. In one sense, it is simple. Believe, repent, and follow. Understand who Jesus is. Confess your sin. Turn to him for the forgiveness of sins. Absolutely. But that is to make a difference from that day onwards. It's more than simply coming up to the front of a service or raising a hand or praying a prayer. Now, don't misunderstand me. Many genuine believers have come to faith that way. You know, hearing the gospel, making a commitment there and then in a service. But the test is what happens in the days that follow. And whether that commitment is more than skin deep. The call of Christ is deeply countercultural. In a society that says self is king... Jesus demands that he is king. In a culture of consumerism, Jesus says, serve me. Count the cost, he says. It is no light thing to choose to be my disciple. Now, that doesn't mean we need to prove ourselves to God. At the heart of the gospel is that good news of forgiveness. At the heart of this gathering was the message that God is gracious. It starts, doesn't it, with what? God has done for them and a reminder of the grace he's shown them. They were saved. They were created by God's grace. And that's the case for every Christian. We don't work our way in. But Jesus says you must be prepared for what follows because to follow me is not a light thing. True faith bears fruit. That fruit follows making Christ Lord of all things. First over our families, first over our jobs, first over our possessions, first over our time. Is he first in every area of your life? That's a searching question, isn't it? And particularly some of the hymns that we've sung this week and last. Do we truly give in the ways that we sing to the Lord? 
Are you trying to share him with an idol? The first half of this chapter reminds us that committing your life to Christ is completely logical. It's the right thing to do because God is completely committed to us. It starts with the work of God in our life. It's a natural response to God's goodness. What response have you made to Jesus? Joshua 24 makes it clear that you can't sit on the fence with God. You must serve someone or something. Who will it be? Now we've got a few verses left. And the book finishes with a ratification ceremony and then some funerals. God reminds the Israelites what he's done for them. And then Joshua sets up a memorial to remind the Israelites of the commitment that they make because they have made that commitment. They've they've said, yes, we will do this. And so he says, okay, let's set something up that will remind you of the commitment you've made this day. In verses 25 to 28, he makes a covenant with the people and that involves two things. Firstly, he writes down God's word for his people. Secondly, he sets up a symbol He takes a large stone as a monument to remind them and and future generations of the commitment they've made, something visible. So that we've got these, these two signs. We've got a written reminder and a visible reminder, the stone and the word of God. Can you see the connections to our own day? Because we have both of those things still, don't we? The written word of God, a verbal reminder. We also have visual reminders. First, we have the Bible. We have the word of God recorded for us. Joshua is part of that word. Joshua wrote not only for the Israelites, but for us. God spoke not only at Shechem to the Israelites, he continues to speak this evening to us here at Three Bridges. This is our written reminder. This is God speaking to us. What's the visual reminder? Baptism, communion, two pictures of the gospel that we we regularly see or participate in. Two reminders of what God has done for us, but also of the commitment we've made. That's especially the case with baptism. When someone is baptized, they are declaring to the world, well, my allegiance is to King Jesus. He is my my Savior. He is now my Lord. It symbolizes what Jesus has done through his death and resurrection, the, the cleansing and washing away of our sins. But it's also declaring, well, Christ is now my Lord. I have been born again to a new life and he's king. And so it's a witness for years to come to ourselves and to others of the response that we've made to this call. So we have our own signs. We don't have a a big stone somewhere, but we have our own symbols, our own visual reminders, and we have the word of God. Indeed, more than these Israelites had at that time. Joshua ends with um, his death and his burial. This faithful man of God is buried in his inheritance, the land that the Lord had given to him. We read about that a few weeks ago. But he's got a greater inheritance ahead of him, his heavenly home. Verse 31 testifies that this generation served the Lord. They did indeed follow through on the commitment it seems it's the generations that follow in the book of judges you can read of what happens next and they fall away pretty quickly as a people they are forgetful joseph and eliezer are also mentioned you might be thinking well why do they suddenly turn up here at the end surely it would wrap up nicely with joshua's death well joseph lived long before the israelites uh, came to the promised land when they were he was there when they were brought to egypt he died and was buried in Egypt, but he was, his desire, he believed that God would keep his word, that God would take them back to the land of Canaan. And he said, it was his last will and testament, well, when that happens, I want you to take me with you. I want to be buried in that land. And so this is God's people keeping that, that, that wish, that desire. Eleazar On the other hand was the high priest, someone at that point in time who served alongside uh, Joshua. He was involved, he was mentioned a few weeks ago with the allocation of the land. 
Both of these men, Joshua and Eleazar, are faithful men of God. Or Joseph, likewise, one from the past, and Eleazar, one in the present. And so Joshua is closing with a look back and a look ahead to faithful, committed believers. And it's also reminding us that God has kept his word to Abraham because Shechem is where God had made that first promise to Abraham 600 years plus before. Again, there's this reminder, a subtle reminder that God has been faithful to his word in every detail, committed to his people's care, consistent in showing them grace, and he calls them to be committed to him then and now. It is a serious call. This is a a somber ceremony at the end. And, and, and Joshua is driving home the point to say, well, this is a serious commitment you're making. But it is a good one. But it's the best decision we can make. Jesus indeed does make radical demands of his disciples. But he also says this in Matthew 10. A reminder that to follow Christ, although tough and costly, is good. That it is a blessing to us. Let me finish with these words. Words of invitation, words of encouragement. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy uh, and my burden is light. The Lord calls his people, those he invites into the kingdom, to be completely committed to him. But he says first, well, I am completely committed to you. Remember the Lord's work in your life. Remember that history of redemption. That's why we should be committed to him. That's the reminder we need to hear to keep walking in those paths faithfully. He is a God of grace. He is a God of greatness and goodness to his people. He is a God who keeps his word, and that's been one of the big messages of the book of Joshua. If he's kept his promises then, he will keep his promises to come, including taking us to his home, that that future home we're promised, the heavenly home, and everything promised in respect to this world in the future. Let me pray for us, and then we'll sing as we close. Father God, we read a passage like this, and we are reminded not only of your goodness and your grace to us, but also of our failure. Lord, those times where we have not been faithful, um, those times where we have not been committed to you, those times where we have sought to live with one foot in this world and one in uh, your kingdom. Lord, forgive us, help us indeed to follow. Help us, Lord, to be mindful of your many blessings Lord, keep us on the path, we pray. We thank you indeed that you promise that you lose none that are yours. And so we commit ourselves into your care, thankful that you are the faithful God and the gracious God who saves. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.